For three years, uh, we lived on twenty-four thousand dollars a year, and I had a, I had a, a, my first kid had just been born, and my wife wasn't working, and and so it's like we're pretty motivated to make it work, and and it and it took a while, uh, but uh, it was great, you know. To a large degree, we had absolutely no idea what we were doing. That was Ken Morris describing what the early days of fly water travel were really like. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. I would love it if you could uh, take a second and leave some feedback, or if you have a question for the show, you can check in here. Uh, if you go to wetflyswing.com slash speak, uh, you can leave a voice message uh, for either a question for the show or a comment about what we have going. It'd be great to hear from you. Ken Morris is here to share the fly water travel story and get into some tips on designing flies with a focus on dry flies. We find out which are his top six go-to flies. We hear about the influence of Dave uh, Whitlock and Mark Bale on the direction of his journey. Then we hear the difference between uh, what uh, going places and knowing places is all about. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsors. Angler's Coffee roasts a full range of coffees with one goal in mind, delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. And I'm one of those anglers who's been loving Angler's Coffee. Great tasting, robust, and good to go. They just released a new subscription program, and you can get 20% off of this box and all products at anglerscoffee.com. Just use the coupon code WETFLYSWING at checkout to get 20% off of great coffee today. That's anglerscoffee.com. We're also brought to you by... In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique custom classic wood net that are second to none in quality and can be customized for a little extra touch. Please head over to wetflyswing.com stonefly to get started today. That's wetflyswing.com stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y, to get started right now. Uh, Lots on travel and dry flies today, so without further ado, here is Ken Morish from flywatertravel.com. How's it going, Ken? Hey, it's good. Good to have you on here. We, uh, we've, I've been thinking about getting you on the show for quite a while. You're, um, you know, obviously flywater travel is a big name out there in the space. You've designed a lot of amazing flies. You've got a big background. In fact, I talked to somebody recently, a guide who said, uh, we maybe get into this, but said, you're a hell of a great fisherman as well. So you've got a lot of accolades uh, behind you, but um, maybe just talk about before we get there, you know, before you got to fly water, how did you first get into fly fishing? Uh, you know, we, we kind of joke that it's the mutant gene in my family. So, you know, my dad was really into it. His father was really into it. And even one generation before sort of the first, one of the Moorishes that got born in the U S was born in a little, uh, mining town uh hard rock gold mining town in the sierra nevadas in california and he was sort of the first to get into it and uh yeah so we've always had something to talk about at our family gatherings and get togethers for for multiple generations and unfortunately my family was sympathetic to the choices i made you know the the joke is i went and you know squandered a relatively expensive private school education, uh, you know, and, and went straight up to Alaska and became a fishing guide. Uh, but again, my family was, was fairly sympathetic and it fortunately worked out. That's awesome. And, and what was the, where was the private school education? I ended up uh, going to Lewis and Clark college, which I now refer to as Lewinsky and Clark college because she's our most famous graduate. Oh, oh, Lewinsky, actually, the uh, Monica. <laughs> yeah, and most people's <laughs> next question is, did you guys overlap while you were there? And the, the answer to that is no, I was, I'm was. i older than she is. Oh, there you go. Life. See, that wasn't going to be my next question. My next question was, whenever I hear <laughs> the uh, private school people faltering on the private schools, I think of, for some reason, I think of Steve Jobs. And uh, I'm not sure if he, did he go to, was it Lewis or Clark? What was his private school he went to? 
You know, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, uh, but he went to um, one of the ones. It was in Oregon. I don't know if it was Lewis and Clark or one of the the high end ones. And he basically went there for like six months and then dropped out and just partied. You know, kind of hung out and and like well, he didn't party necessarily, but hung out. And obviously, you know, he became kind of well known. So, uh, <laughs> so I guess you don't have to actually, um, you know, complete something. Or did you complete your degree? Well, I did, and yeah, my other regret was, you know, actually completing it in four years. If I'd been smarter, I would have stayed longer because yeah, it was pretty fun. Yeah, it was a good time. It was a it was a good time, and uh, yeah, I I I got an English major there, and. Uh, yeah, because I think that's a great a great major for people who don't know what they want to do. That's right. That's right. You and uh, uh, John Gerock, he he was on in a past episode, and <laughs> <laughs> I asked him the same thing. I said, John, we were talking about college, and he 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 went through in like the '60s, right, in that, that period. And I asked him, you know, he said the same thing. He said it's a great degree when you don't know what you, you want to do; you just kind of go for it. So yeah, so I was, you know, so college. So you you're at this this private college, uh, going to school there, and I'm assuming you're doing some fishing. How did you take it from the college that period into like a, a business in fly fishing, or t- take us to that, you know, basically from there to to into fly water travel? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I I did fish a, a fair amount in college, but not very effectively. And you know, I I I went. I used to go steelhead fishing on the the shoots and uh, and the sandy in particular, but I, I didn't really have any mentors, and so like basic principles uh, like slowing the fly down, uh, I didn't really no one had really explained that to me. So you know I could throw the a teeny three hundred across the river, but oh, what it was doing in the water wasn't that effective. But you know eventually I caught some nice steelhead at the late end of my education there and and that was one of the motivations of going to school up in Oregon and getting out of the bay area uh but uh yeah then i promptly uh packed up and got a job guiding in Alaska and my first guide job up there was at a place called Bristol Bay Lodge and uh you know i was super green i was really tough on the boats and equipment but you know, I was getting it done on the water, and so that was uh, that was a, a fun chapter. And when I came back from guiding, I, I started working at uh, a fly shop in the Bay Area. There was a place called uh, Woolies Fly Fishing Outfitters, and he had a downtown San Francisco store and one in Lafayette. And that later became an entity called Leland's uh, through a sale. And uh, and so, yeah, I worked there for a couple of years and uh, I started guiding in Northern California and teaching on water fishing classes and, you know, just being a standard, you know, fly shop rat and working behind the counter and selling stuff. And yeah, then I went back and did another season in Alaska at a different operation and then I really thought I wanted to be a fly fishing rep thereafter, and I kind of joked that I well, I, I pranced into Mark Bale's office at uh, Sage, and I said, "Hey, I really, I really want to be a rep for Sage." And he looked at me and he said, "Do you have any experience?" And I said, uh, "No, I." I have absolutely none. And he says, "You know, that's really not going to do." And uh, and so then I sort of uh, flitted around with a, another position at Sage that never came my way, and that didn't work. And so I was sort of at a bit of a, a dead end there. And I like to tell a story about Mark Bale because you know he and I are now on the sort of the Far Bank leadership team together, and we have a, a wonderful friendship. So I've been really fortunate to get to know him later on in, in his career uh, as well and, uh, and and he's just you know such an interesting character I don't know if you've done uh, a podcast with him but uh, yeah he's he's the best connected fly fisherman in the world and he's a hell of an angler and he's one of the the most articulate and interesting guys you'll meet and you know, he's one of the the guys who's he's the smartest guy in the room and and uh and he's a, he's a lot of fun so yeah I'd encourage you to pursue him and his career which is spanning over 35 years I think with uh, Sage is uh, about to sunset 
uh, this next October. So yeah, get get him while you can. He's a, he's a great guy. But uh, when he had the good sense to not hire me, I uh, I took my little my first little venture out of the fly fishing space because I was back living at home and I didn't have any income and my parents were pissed at me and and uh, and uh, you know I, I I got this job in outside sales trying to sell like water purification systems to large businesses that use bottled water and I just pounded the shit out of the pavement and I never ever made a single sale uh and uh, it was really frustrating and then uh, a sort of a connection from my past who I had become acquainted with through my old mentor Andre Puyans uh invited me to come work for him in Seattle and he was a, a Japanese illegal alien who built super high end custom fly rods and they were with helical cores and they were made out of, you know, different sections were made out of different moduluses of graphites and uh, we had they had different ferrule designs for each connection and and so we hand made these these really interesting rods and then we exported them to Japan and you know back in the I don't know in the yeah, like in 19 91 and stuff you know we were they, these things were selling for Fourteen hundred dollars a piece, uh, and uh, and most of the market was in Japan. But we really handmade each one, and uh, and interestingly enough, through that job in in uh, search for components, uh, we contacted Struble, and that's uh, how I ended up meeting George Cook for the first time. And so George was coming by and he was going to show us some real seats and this guy I worked for whose name was Hisatsugu Haneda aka uh Henry Haneda or as we like to call him Dis Henry uh he uh is really a bizarre individual and, and sort of a, a sort of a, a crazy genius with uh, truly bizarre social skills and so as opposed to just dropping this bomb on George when we were waiting for George to come and show us the product. I, I said, hey, George, I'm going to get in the elevator. I, I said to Henry, I said, Henry, I'm going to get in the elevator. I'm going to go down and meet George, and uh, and I'll bring him up. And he said, oh, that was a good idea. So I, I met George downstairs. We got in the elevator, and I just said, hey, George, I, I'm just warning you, you, this meeting you're going to go into is going to be bizarre because uh, Henry is bizarre. And he's like, all right, man, good enough. And and so we had uh, our meeting, and, and Henry always referred to Sage as a Sagey, you know, and he 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 no like Sagey rod so much, you know, and and uh, and when he showed George Cook his rod, he'd only show him the butt section of it. He wouldn't let him, you know, flex it or anything like that. And, and so we did have a good bizarre meeting, and we we bought some components and we we built some rods with it, and that was all fine and dandy, but. Uh, that meeting with George Cook led to him calling me sometime later and saying, hey, there's a, a fellow who's opening a fly shop in Ashland, Oregon, and he's looking for a fly shop manager. And this guy uh, named Steve Rowe, who, you know, uh, well, later went to become Kerry Berkheimer's primary financial backer. He called me down and we had a, a good meeting and as a result, I said, "Hey, if you know if you're interested in hiring me, uh, I'd really like you to consider my girlfriend working for the company as well." And so ultimately, we moved down to Ashland, Oregon, and I, I ran a fly shop there and a, a fly shop and an outdoor store, and you know taught classes and, and tying and on water classes and did a little side guiding. And so that was a, a, a sort of a nice tenure and got me to this incredible place where I live. And it was sort of dumb luck that, that led me here. And uh, and after about six years of that, I had an opportunity to to begin fly water travel. And, and that sort of happened on a chance meeting 
at a fly tackle dealer show, I became reacquainted with uh, a guy named Brad Jackson. And Brad Jackson was the co-founder of the fly shop in Redding, California. And he and Mike Mitchlack had started that store together. And after 10 years of working together, they were no longer very fond of one another. And so they parted ways. And and the short story is that Brad Jackson had to sign a a 10-year non-compete clause. And at the end of that 10-year non-compete clause, uh, Brad was interested in re-entering the fly fishing space in sort of a peripheral context and was most interested in in seeing a travel company start up. And so he called me and said, hey, Ken, I want to uh, see if you're interested in this idea of, of starting a, a travel company. And I was interested in it, and I, I said to him to right out of the gate, I said, hey, if we're going to do this, I need I need to bring in a partner because I have – some of the skills that would be useful for these, but I, I really lack a lot of the skills in terms of, you know, true business management and finance. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of things I'm, I'm really bad at. And, uh, and so he agreed to that. And, and that's when I, uh, there was one guy that I knew who'd been a, a fly fishing student of mine, but he was a, a peer and a friend and had become a really close fishing buddy of mine. And that was this guy, Brian Geese. And, and Brian Geese was a, a industry outsider, but he's just the smartest and most practical guy that I know. And I said, "Hey, Brian. I said, Did you, you know, would you consider starting this venture with me?" And he said, "Yep. I'm, I'm, I'm going to travel. I'm going to, I'm quitting my job. I'm going to travel around the world on the cheap. And when I get back, we'll do it." And so that was sort of the the origin of of Flywater Travel. And so he and I started it in a in a little. Uh, free space that this guy Steve Rowe who I used to work for loaned us and and we brought Steve Rowe in as a small minority partner and uh, he gave us you know free rent and uh, and we scrounged together uh, some startup capital from various sources any way that we could and uh, yeah for for three years uh, we lived on twenty four thousand dollars a year, and I had a I had a, a my first kid had just been born, and my wife wasn't working, and and so it's like we're pretty motivated to make it work, and and it and it took a while, uh, but uh, it was great, you know. To a large degree, we had absolutely no idea what we were doing, and. Uh, and what we had was sort of, you know, persistence and uh, adequate people skills and a passion for fishing. And, and, you know, we had writing and photography skills. And so we could create the marketing stuff. And, you know, certain people sort of spoke up for us and said, hey, these guys are going to do a good job. You should you should let them come see your operation. Let them come for a quick comp stay. And so we spent... Uh, I spent one year sort of half managing this outdoor store and fly shop and at the same time traveling all around the world and visiting with lodges and getting the images and the needed content and just establishing those business relationships. And we sort of really did that year and in 99 was the real traveling around year and then uh, we came out with our first catalog in uh, in 2000, and we've just been sort of jamming since then. And you know, now there's a uh, 12 of us full time, and it's become a pretty thriving entity with you know 200 and. 30 destinations around the world that we represent and and a lot of really special close relationships with both clients and and outfitters yeah. alike. Yeah, that's a it's an amazing story. 
there's so many little uh, side tangents I'd love to dig into. I, I um, you know, I mean, now it's you guys pretty much. It's uh, Yellow Dog, the Fly Shop. Uh, I mean, there's only you're up there. I mean, with the, a few of the big ones, right? I mean, does it feel like? I mean, obviously you put in. I'm not sure how many years that takes us to get to where you are now, but um, <laughs> does it feel <laughs> like? Uh, I mean, what does it feel like when you look back at that whole story you just told? I mean, it's been some work and along the way, but it sounds like the connections you've made have been. You think that's been the most important thing along the way? Yeah, you know, I think that we built this business uh, in a very different fashion than than the the other folks in the space and and so and, and today you know in light of the pandemic and uh, uh things like that we're we're really grateful for the way that we built the company and so we really built it on personal relationships you know uh and, and treating people right you know treating other people the way we want to be treated uh, and that applied to both outfitters and customers and and so we do have really strong personal relationships and i'd say that you know when it comes to outfitters we really are trying to help them achieve their goals and and trying to hold on to things loosely we're not really a very power over type company we're sort of a hey let's let's partner together and, and get some stuff done that's that's good for all of us and and so yeah what is interesting is in we're not a promotional company either uh, historically and so we have you know we printed more catalogs in our first five years of business than we print today and you know really our marketing and promotional budget has hardly changed over 20 years and so we were a, a pretty profitable company and uh and two and a half years ago we sold the company to far bank enterprises and so you know far bank owns sage rio and reddington and they'd come knocking on our door maybe eight or nine years ago as well and uh we we were sort of taken aback and weren't ready to do that and hadn't accomplished much of, of what we had hoped to accomplish but this next time they came knocking we we gave it some really serious consideration and eventually struck a deal and brian and i still run the company today and it's exciting now because you know now we do have the opportunity to take advantage of of some really low-hanging promotional fruit that that we just hadn't done in the past you know we never purchased ads we never sponsored film festivals we never paid for a click online uh we never did any of those things and we didn't need to we got all of our business through referral and repeat and you know and we grew into one of the the biggest players in the space super organically without forcing our hand and so now we still have that strength of relationships and we also have you know some some additional marketing and promotional firepower behind us and we were able to you know withstand the pandemic with a, a really complete staff here which was a, a big blessing that far bank brought to the table for us so that's been a, a good chapter, and uh, yeah, you know, looking back on it, uh, yeah, it's funny looking back on it, but I'd say, you know, yeah, we worked hard, and we did we did the right thing most of the time, and, uh, and you know, we got lucky and, and worked with good people, and, you know, so we've, we've gotten some good lucky breaks, uh, and, and I think a lot of that also has to do with just yeah. treating people yeah, right. That's cool. I, I love that you mentioned that back in George Cook and I just chatted with him this morning uh, on a podcast and uh, you know it's always fun he's always got a good perspective on things uh, it's interesting I look at you mentioned the back to that outside sales job where you didn't sell anything I mean you know you didn't sell anything there but you had to eventually sell uh, you know fly water right a product how, how did you did you actually get into like embracing the sales and get better at it or how did that all go yeah you know I, I wouldn't say that you know we 
we weren't looking to sell the company, and and so we were really approached. And so I wouldn't say that there was any salesmanship uh, per se involved in in in, in the transaction transition to Farbank. I would just say that uh, you know our salesmanship. I'd say it was we've been practicing it all along, and we made a valuable company with that. So you know we got we're we're good salespeople. And you know, yeah, sure. There's some 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 pitching and posturing in the in the process of selling the business, but you know, it, it's not like the the big lie of a, a you know IPO or something like that, where you're really blowing a lot of smoke up someone's ass. Uh, it, it, it's a it was a pretty straightforward deal. You know, the numbers are the numbers, and you know, it, it's not like a service business has this enormous amount of blue sky. You know, if you sell widgets or something like that, you know, the, the sales price can be really, really high. And for a service company, it's just different. And, and, and so, yeah, I wouldn't say that, that there was a, a lot no. of pitch well, what, in that. And what about your selling to just, you know, as you're starting out with Flywater, the first few years you were, I mean, you were having to find people, right, and, and sell your, essentially your product. Yeah, yeah, and so that really was relationally built too. So you know, the origins of our company were a very meager amount of startup capital uh, that that Brian and I came up with, and so it was really back to personal relationships. So I had a lot of relationships uh, from you know my I don't know six or seven years only in the industry there, and and I was already active with. Uh, you know, writing articles and doing images and things like that. So I, I leveraged that. And then, you know, we really built our list the hard way. When we got one customer, we said, hey, you got any friends that we can send our catalog to? So we did a lot of personal letters. We did a, a lot of catalog mailings to, to individuals with, with personalized cover letters and a lot of follow-up. And we literally asked all the people that we knew for any of the people that they knew. And so we built a really high quality list that way. And we had some customers, you know, that would come through and give us a list of 20 fishing buddies. And, uh, and so, so that's, that's how we built it. And we, and so we made a lot of what I would say would be, uh, warm, or lukewarm sales calls where, yep, we sent the catalog to someone and then we followed up with a phone call and introduced ourselves. And that was, that was scary. I still remember, you know, back in the day we'd have little, you know, cue notes on our computer about, you know, different talking points. And, and Brian and I worked together in a very small space. And so we would sort of absorb one another's sales styles and knowledge. And so, you know, uh, I, I had a lot of words for describing fisheries and fishing experiences and, and Brian, you know, would, would adopt those and modify those. And then he had a lot of tactics for tracking people because he, he had a background in sales. He was a, uh, a window and doors uh, and door salesman for a you know a, a wood product company called Anderson Windows and Doors and so so he he had more true sophisticated sales experience than I did and so together you know we just learned from each other and uh, and went for it and like I say we didn't know much about what we were doing and uh, out of the gate, but you know, the very first guys that ever wrote us a check to go to Christmas Island, that was the first trip we ever sold officially. Uh, they, they're still customers of ours today and, and we see them around town and, uh, yeah, uh, Steve Haskell and Peter Ware. And, and so that was, that was great. And, you know, we had a lot of interesting growing pains throughout the process. I remember when, when Brian said, Hey man, you know, I think we need to create an itinerary for every trip that we sell. And I was like, are you kidding me? That's crazy. You know, that's, that's way too much work. We can't do that. And, 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 you know, so to look back on all these, these different 
steps that we made to improve the business. Uh, you know, that that's kind of impressive for me in hindsight. And I've, I'd say a lot of that's really driven by my partner, Brian. You know, he's he's not scared of change and he's really into improving the business for the customer. And so uh, with, with his sort of... Uh, confidence and foresight we were able to continue to grow and adapt and uh, i'm really really grateful for everything that he brings to that's the awesome. table yeah no i and you mentioned the referrals and follow-ups i mean that's i was just listening to a podcast where a uh, a sales i can't remember her name i'll put a link in the show notes but it's a pretty famous sales uh, gal and and she mentioned that she she says she was saying that like 80 percent of your leads should be coming from referrals Right. Instead of the instead of the cold call. I mean, so I think you guys were already yep. doing it. That's the amazing thing is that I think business is actually kind of easy. Right. You, you provide a good product and you provide great service. Yeah. And uh, and it sounds like you, you guys did that and you knew some people and, and built a cool company, which is a great story. Yeah, but it, yeah, no, it's been it, – and and uh, more than 80 percent of our business has been grown on on client referral repeat and referral and, and so uh yeah that that broad reaching marketing you know uh, you know you know the fly shop in reading you know they they had this incredible catalog business that uh, that would really feed their travel but you know they there have been years when they've sent out you know more than 300,000 catalogs and uh, and so, you know, that's a, that's a real different stream that feeds them. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, we've accomplished all that the other companies have done and, and, and more in cases, uh, but just through a really different channel. Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Stonefly starts the design process by selecting wood for the handle based on a number of key factors, including grain pattern and depth, but they don't stop there. This piece of art is accentuated by strips of hardwood that complement and accentuate the handcrafted handle. To be honest, I have never been much of a net guy, uh, mainly because I didn't feel like my collapsible net was the easiest to use or was uh, easy on the eye, if you know what I mean. Uh, the Stonefly net not only looks beautiful, but has high quality netting that is easy on the fish and will last for years to come. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique classic wood net that is second to none and that can be customized for a little extra touch. For Ethan, the founder of Stonefly Nets, fly fishing has always had a traditional feel going back to fishing the three-weight bamboo rod with his great-grandmother. When Ethan designs a custom net, it's his hope that others will create these amazing lasting memories as well. Please head over to wetflyswing.com stonefly to get your custom net. That's wetflyswing.com stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y, to get started right now. What's worse than a day with no bites, a day without coffee, or even worse, a day with bad coffee? Thankfully, that isn't the case for us. With more than 40 years of experience in coffee, the Angler's Coffee Team roasts a full range of coffees with one goal in mind, delivering excellent coffee to every angler. That's why they've released a brand new coffee subscription program made just for you. Just visit anglerscoffee.com, provide your coffee preferences, your mailing address, and how much coffee you drink in a week, and they'll take care of the rest. There's no obligations or hidden fees, just great coffee delivered to your front door. And I've been using and loving Angler's Coffee recently, and I am what most people would consider a coffee fanatic and is what pretty much keeps this podcast going strong. Uh, so yeah, join me in supporting uh, this great company who supports great coffee, fly fishing, and conservation. As part of Angler's Conservation Alliance, Angler's Coffee will be donating a portion of every sale to help conserve and protect our natural habitats. Right now, they're raising money for Soul River, which brings veterans and inner city youth out to the river to teach conservation, fishing skills, and much more. Right now, you can get 20% off your first subscription box or gift box. Simply use the code WETFLYSWING at checkout. 
Just visit anglerscoffee.com and get 20% off your first subscription box or gift box using Wet Fly Swing at checkout. That's anglerscoffee.com. And now back to our show. Well, this has been awesome. The, 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 feed, or the summary here has been great. We could obviously dig into more. But I did want to touch on uh, a little bit on some of your fly patterns because you not only have um, you know what you have going there with fly water, but you've designed plenty of flies. Uh, so, yeah, maybe we can just start. We're, we're kind of in a dry fly season talking about dry flies. And I know off air we talked a little bit about some of your patterns. And maybe we can just start this, start this off with, you know, when you think of your patterns, I'm not sure. How many do you think you have you've designed that are actually out that people could buy in a catalog somewhere? Yeah, well, that number has uh, has fluctuated. You know, I used uh, I originally started out being a fly designer for uh, a company called Idle Wild, and and that was a really great run. Uh, and then that uh, that company imploded, and uh, at that time I transitioned to Umqua Feather Merchants, uh, and that's where you know, I designed for them at this point, and that's great also. Uh, and I don't know, I, I probably, I've probably had, you know, maybe 40 different patterns out in the commercial market and some have really thrived and some have been discontinued and, and, and in many cases there'll be, you know, multiple uh, sizes uh, and or color schemes of different patterns. So yeah, I've done done a lot of stuff in in a lot of different categories. Uh, I probably, you know, uh, I, I probably came out of the gate strongest in in being a trout nymph tire, but uh, but over time and while well, I do steelhead and saltwater stuff and jungle stuff and I've designed designed all that, uh, you know. Trout flies is where the money's at, and so that's that's uh, that's the stream that I've most uh, closely followed. And uh, yeah, I'd say my, but I'd say my most well recognized and best selling flies uh, happen to be dry flies. And uh, you know, I say starting with the Moorish mouse, which is a unconventional dry fly. Uh, you know, that's a well-recognized fly and, and, you know, it doesn't sell as many units as a chubby Chernobyl, but it, uh, it, it's a good one. And then my, my very best selling dry fly is something called the Moorish Hopper, which is a, a foam bug. And that, uh, that, that, that's, that was kind of a, a funny story of, of developing that. And I can go into that if you like. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Let's go. On. Before we get there, I just want to talk in uh, briefly. So you mentioned the chubby Chernobyl. That that was not your pattern. I wish, uh, <laughs> but that was uh, that 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 was uh, my great friend Chris Conaty's pattern. He worked for Idlewild, and he created that fly, but he created it as a uh, as an employee of the company, as opposed to being a royalty tire, and so. He he is a sort of a unsung hero, and and he's created what may be the single best-selling dry fly in America, uh, but without the benefit of having that backed up by a royalty contract. And uh, but I worked very closely with Chris uh, at Idlewild, and yeah, he's a great guy and a great tire, and. Uh, yeah, so I, I think highly of him and his work. So foam, foam is not dead. Foam is still good. To... Well, yeah, and so that's uh, that's <laughs> sort of a preview of the of the, the 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 hopper story. So, you know, I a lot of times I look and see if there are gaps in the market of what what the the fly market needs, and and when embarking on that, I was like, man. None of the grasshoppers out there on the market met my standards in terms of what I thought a grasshopper should look like. And I, I feel like a lot of people go into fly tying with the assumption that they understand what the natural looks like. And then they go and they create a pattern based off of their 
their image of of what the natural is. And when I looked at true grasshoppers and I looked at grasshopper flies, I'm like, no, none of them, none of them have it right. And so I I caught a number of different grasshoppers and I stuck pins through them and I kept them uh you know on right beneath my fly tying light just stabbed into my my countertop there and i looked at them for a year and i spun, spun them around and looked at them and i would try different iterations tying a fly this way and that way and eventually i said hey, the only way i'm actually going to get the right profile and body shape is by you know, laminating foam together and then sculpting it. And so my, the, the Moorish hopper was sculpted foam. And, and then, you know, I basically just lash that foam onto a hook shank with a little, you know, slit to, to hold it on there. And when I fished my initial prototypes, I was really happy. And when I, you know, shared those flies with other people, they were, they were like, wow, that's, that's, that thing's got a lot of game. And when I submitted it initially to Idlewild, I was pretty proud of myself. And usually every time I design a new fly, I'm like, oh, man, this one's really going to be awesome, you know. And, and usually that's not the case. But uh, uh, in this one, I had a really good feeling about it. I was like, this thing's going to rock the boat. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to sell. And people are going to catch fish with it, and blah, blah, blah. And they looked at it, and they, they rejected it. They said, no, we don't, we don't like it. We, we, we don't think that's going to sell. And, and, and one of the great lines, which I'll attribute to, uh, maybe that was to Chris, maybe it was his business partner, but someone said to me, well, you know, I think foam is dead. And I, I, w- I was pissed and, and, and I was pissed enough that they didn't accept it, that I didn't tie any new submissions for two years. And I sort of just sulked. And at the end of that two year period, I was like, you know what, I'm sending it back to him. And I sent it back to him. I said, I think you should reconsider. And that time they did. And when they started producing those flies in their factories uh, in the Philippines, they did a great job. I mean, uh, I'm always impressed how some factories can can tie, you know, they just get better at it than, than I ever got because they do it such regularity and so they released a great product and the moorish hopper went on to become the best-selling fly of of all of idlewild's patterns and and it was it was singularly responsible for half of all of their royalty fly sales and so it was a it was a big hit and foam was not dead and, uh, and and so yeah, that was just kind of a, a fun story that that came full circle from rejection into to acceptance. What, what year was that? When, in your in the your timeline when you when you got that acceptance? Oh, I don't know. That must have been. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it was around uh, two thousand ten oh, or oh, something okay. like 2010. that. Two thousand ten. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, so maybe something like that. So you're well uh, into uh, fly. When did Flywater? Uh, when was that founded or started? It was. Uh, we're a little over twenty years oh, wow. old yeah, now. Yeah. We released. Yeah, we released our first catalog in in That's right, 2000, 2000, and we really started the company in 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 ninety nine. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So you got a good. Yeah, I mean, you got a good chunk. That's the thing. You you look back. You've got a huge. I mean, you've been in the industry for a long time now, right? I mean, do you, what what do you say? You're kind of like thirty. Yeah, years, my yeah. whole my whole adult life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So so more than uh, more than half of my years. I'm 54 years old yeah. now, and yeah, you know, I sort of entered the industry space at about 21. Huh. And I like to say, I'm I think I'm absolutely unemployable outside <laughs> of the fly fishing space. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And, uh, it's uh, it's really cool. I've uh, had so many different conversations with people from all ends of the spectrum. And I love hearing the different stories, but I think in fly fishing, yeah, I think it comes back to that. You know, you just kind of, pe- people love this space because it's a lot of good people and maybe there isn't billions of dollars. I don't even know if there's a billion dollar company, but, but there's a lot of good people, right? Do, do you feel, I mean, what do you love most about the fly fishing space? Is that, you know, is it something like that or what keeps you going? Well, you know, I mean, I, I remain a very, uh, 
engaged and passionate angler. So I got a lot of time for being on the water and I've got a lot of time for my home waters. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the hard things about doing fly water is that it, it really took away from my ability to fish close to home. You know, if I had, you know, a wife and two kids and, you know, would work a lot of hours and then, you know, I get to go on these super cool business trips to, you know, far off interesting fisheries and then to come home and, you know, tell my family that I, you know, want to go fishing locally, you know, that, that was pretty hard to, that's been hard to do. And I've done it and I've, I've got to fish locally, but like I say, I've got a lot of time for that. So staying in the fishing space uh, is, is, is first and foremost, you know, based on, me still really loving fishing and you know catching fish isn't isn't always my top priority anymore i'm a real passionate photographer and so yeah being in the outdoor space and you know just getting an excuse to to go on these little you know mini adventures you know that's 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 a lot of it and obviously i have a, a lot of folks that I know in the fly fishing space and, and, you know, many of whom I, I haven't had a lot of time to personally fish with, but, you know, I'm still, I still want to take advantage of all of that. But a lot of my fishing has been work related and, uh, and, and I've got a lot of gas in the tank for that. And again, I have got a lot of gas in the tank for, for personally fishing and experimenting with flies and, trying things out so yeah i'm 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 a, first and foremost i'm a, a very passionate and engaged angler i i love fishing yeah that's great yeah that's uh yeah i totally i mean i think that's the thing you've been able to make your uh, business you know i've been it's, it's allowed you to get out and, and travel which i think is part of the thing with the fly fish at least for i think a lot of people as they the more you get into it you realize yeah it's not necessarily the number of fish you catch but i mean traveling and that's what i love the fact that there's that opportunity to travel and meet you know, local cultures and, you know, people from around the world and just experience, you know what I mean? Like that's for me what I'm excited about for for my next 10 or 20 years. Exactly. And, and, you know, I'm still super excited about that. And, and, you know, and, and, and to some degree I've even spun 180 on that where I go, man, you know, I've got, I've had the opportunity to go, darn near everywhere fishing and and so i've been around the block and back in terms of exotic fisheries and if someone said well kenny you know you can't ever travel internationally again but you can fish three times as much within a four-hour radius of where you live you know what do you think i'd go oh, yeah i'll take that deal you know i i uh, i love where i live in southern oregon is is really interesting and there's uh you know it, it's it's a place where i drive in you know all four directions to fish and i've got year-round opportunities and uh and there's a lot out there and so i i love the local fishing and i do love traveling to fish i mean there's so much great stuff out there and there's still lots of stuff i'd like to see but uh yeah i'm i'm not as bent on fishing internationally uh on a personal basis uh as i as i have been in the past because I've, I've had that opportunity and uh, yeah i could i could swing it right back to the home waters and go you know what i really i really want to dial in my you know my my understanding of some local fisheries and you know there's going places and that's one thing and then there's really knowing places and that's a different type of of knowledge and a different type of satisfaction and i i i'd like to have more of that in my my future yeah uh, but you know the other thing that really keeps me engaged in the space is you know the customers that i get to deal with at flywater travel you know by and large they're they're such a pleasure right i mean these are smart successful passionate folks and so you know i have all these people that i consider really close friends many of whom i've never met face to face and you know they're from different walks of life and different uh you know political and religious beliefs and some of them are you know overseas and they're from all different states and so that's that's a lot of fun and then 
uh, you know, the same is true of, of these lodge owners and outfitters and guides. You know, there's some great folks out there. And when I get to develop a, a solid working relationship with people like that, it typically develops into a friendship as well. And, and so, you know, there, there's a lot of people out there that I know that I'd, that I'd love to spend time with outside of their business interests and my business interests. And, you know, I'll just do something a little more casual together moving forward. And, and obviously I love the opportunity to, to be with them in a true business setting, uh, meaning, you know, visiting them at their lodger operation or traveling with guests to different places. Uh, you know, I've got a, a nice, uh, posse of folks that I can call on for personal hosted trips who are just a ton of fun. So, yeah, it's hard to to really tire of that. I mean, I've I've got a, a I've got a great job and an incredible network of both consumers and outfitters that I really enjoy. That's cool. Yeah, I love that quote you you said the uh, knowing places and going places. You know, it's like the you know, the guides, right? The guides are the ones they definitely know their, their place. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm kind of more, like I said, I'm more on the going places. So I might have to, uh, hit you up and take your, uh, take your place for some of the, <laughs> the travel you're not doing. Yeah, well, yeah, you bet, you bet. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think I wanted to hit on just cause you know, we have a lot of people that listen to this and they love the, the tips and tricks. So I wanted to go back to the, the fly design just before we get out of here and maybe mm-hmm. just first the, the Moorish Hopper. I mean, I'll put a link in the show notes to what that looks like. But can you describe that pattern just quickly? What what it's uh, what it kind of does somebody who doesn't have it in front of them? Well, yeah, it's sort of a, a two tone foam fly that that really uh, is is cut out of foam uh, with the exact outline of a grasshopper, and then there's rubber legs attached to the outside of it, and a little eyeball painted on it. But you know what? What I think is interesting about that fly and one of the ways I really like to look at fly designs is is if I hold that fly up uh, against a bright background and I get a black silhouette of it and I spin it around on on you know a, a number of different axes that 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 fly has a really true silhouette and really true proportions and I think for me, that's a really important criteria. It also happens with the foam to have a really similar density to a natural hopper, so it sort of lands with the same uh, w- with the same mass, makes a similar type of splat. It happens to float very similarly in the surface film. You know, it's not riding super high or riding super low. And like I say, it just has a really great silhouette and profile. And and that's the thing that uh, that I think a lot of people miss is what is this black and white silhouetted profile and how does that compare to naturals? And you know, in a you know, we have an assumption that, oh, you know, does a cone head marabou muddler look like a sculpin and i'm gonna go no i mean i can tell i can envision it's it's silhouette you know sculpin has a as a broad round flat head it doesn't have a cone and it doesn't taper back into a trimmed deer hair and then have a big blown out collar and then the big thing i see is on you know a lot of wet flies in particular is you see these sort of fanned out brush like backs where is the real shape of nature is more like, you know, for a bait fish is more like a teardrop, you know, it's got a, it's, it, it contiguously tapers towards the rear. And so, you know, I'm always looking at, at things like that and fly design, or I look at, okay, you know, Hey, nymphs have six legs. They don't have 16 legs, uh, you know, so people overdress things uh, constantly or, you know, people think that a salmon fly, you know, uh, to tie, that they can have a great big bushy hackle in the front. Well, it can, but if you really look at the silhouette of a salmon fly, you know, a salmon fly has a really skinny, narrow head, and a golden stone fly has a, a broader, huskier head on it. And so I really take the time to look at uh, at what 
naturals look like. And and there was a book that was really influential when I was a kid. And you know, I was a I was a crazy fly tire, you know, starting at about age ten. And and I went to fly fly tying competitions as a kid. Like my my local club, the Diablo Valley Fly Fishermen, they would send me to to, to fly tying competitions at the fly at the conclave that was put on by the Federation of Fly Fishers and stuff and and so yeah, I used to be in casting and tying competitions as a as a kid, uh, and most of this was based off of this mentorship by this guy Andy Puyans, who was a a, a well known and 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 in many cases notorious uh, character in the Bay Area, who was very much liked by his his devotees and followers, and and also very much disliked by others. You know, you're sort of in or out with this guy, and and I was lucky enough to be in and learn a lot from him but you know i remember he sold me a book that that i still think is one of the great books out there which is uh dave whitlock's guide to aquatic trout foods and you know dave is is uh, i don't know dave whitlock but i have mad respect for him as a as a true you know renaissance angler and and his illustrations are are the best and his fly designing abilities are extraordinary and and so, you know, really looking at line drawings of what a stonefly nymph looks like or what a swimming caddis pupa looks like, you know, that had a deep impression. And when you you get a good artist to move something into a, a black and white or a line style drawing, um, you learn a lot from that. And so, uh, so yeah, I like studying things when they're sort of broken down into those simple elements of of their proportions and not getting, you know, blinded by the colors, you know, if you really look at the shape of how an adult mayfly sits on the water, it's so radically different than than how mayflies are designed. And and so, you know, like my little uh May Day adult mayfly, you know, is, is getting closer to this, but, you know, if, if the way a mayfly sits on the water, it has a very broad footprint and, uh, and then, you know, its wing really towers above the center of its body and the, uh, you know, the back of its body and its tail rarely, if ever, even touches the water so really you're just looking at this big footprint with this uh you know sitting on top of the water and and a wing with a really pronounced silhouette sort of bent back and so you know like when i designed the the may day i was like okay i want this to have a big footprint i want to try to get the hackle barbs unlike a parachute to extend down beneath the plane of the belly of the fly to support the fly more or less above the water. And I want to have the tail, I want to have the body be really short and I want to have the tail sort of push up as a support network. Uh, And, you know, if it sinks down, yeah, it might look like a shuck, but, you know, really I want to have a really short round footprint because that's how duns are on the water. Obviously a spinner's something different entirely, but uh, like I say, we have these assumptions of how flies should be designed and how insects behave and, you know, really stepping back and spending a lot of time observing and evaluating the true natural before you begin designing. You know, that's been uh, a technique that I've been using and I hope refining over my career. That's that's cool. Yeah. The so do you think the exact um, you know for dry flies is more of an exact fly tying uh, you know doing it more exact versus say like the nymphs where the you know like euro nymphs work great and there's some of those don't even look like bugs. Do you think with dry flies it's more important to be exact match or there's some flies that are kind of more suggestive? Well, I mean, obviously, you know how people fish is the most important thing, and 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 proper technique and presentation matter. And then, you know, I'd say that, that the, the hierarchy of import is, is size, shape, color, and realism isn't that important. But if you think about how 
a mayfly sits on the water and what that looks like from beneath. And, you know, if you've got, you know, let's say, you know, you know, a classic Adams with a really long tail extending that's on the water, you know, the profile, the, the, the impression that that's making on the water is oftentimes two and a half times longer than that of a natural. And so that's just a type of mindfulness, right? And, and so I'm not saying it needs to be realistic, but it's it's basically a, a sort of an engineering challenge, I think, in terms of dry flies. It, it, it's not like, you know, I'm, I am impressed by people who can tie ultra-realistic flies, but I'm also totally repulsed by them. And, and I don't think they have any place in the box, right? And so, so yeah, to me... Uh, I am much more interested in engineering than I am in being ultra realistic. And so, okay, yeah, does it have the right density? Does it have the right silhouette? Does it leave an accurate footprint, if you will, on the water surface? And those things are really important for me in in dry fly fishing. You know, the Moorish mouse is not at all realistic. It doesn't look like a mouse at all. And people tie mice that are super cool looking, look just like mice, and, and, and that's awesome. But, you know, the objective with the Moorish mouse was, I want something that I can cast on a five-way. You know, that was first. And so I want to have maximum profile. I want to have minimal materials. Uh, and I And in an engineering sense, I want something that doesn't get waterlogged and that can stay on the surface in in fast or slow currents and that that uh, can you know perform throughout the course of a day without becoming mushy saturated blah 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 and and so so yeah to me uh the engineering elements are much more important than the realistic elements Perfect. Perfect. And do you have with your dry flies, you mentioned there's like maybe 40 over the years you've had, do you, or not, that's all flies, but do you have uh, maybe a top, um, I don't know if you have 10 or so flies or you could talk about that you would put in your list of your, your top go-to fly. You've mentioned a few of them, the, the, the Moorish uh, may. Yeah. The, yeah. Well, you sort of have a yeah emphasis on the dry fly fishing, you know, in, in terms of dry fly fishing, obviously, you know, uh, the hoppers are real solid pattern. Um, I do, there's a lot of things I like about the May Day, which is a mayfly done. It's a difficult fly to tie properly for the consumer and unfortunately for the factories at times. Uh, but it's, uh, but when that fly is tied properly, I really, I really like that one. It, it's, uh, it's, it's very discreet. It's very effective. Uh, and so, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, I'm a big fan of the mouse for, you know, that specialized application. Um, you know, I have a adult salmon fly that I think is, is especially the, the Moorish, uh, fluttering salmon flies is, is a really, really solid pattern. And, you know, I feel bad for the factory that they have to tie it. You know, that one's pretty elaborate and hard to tie and I don't want to ever tie it again, but, but it's a, it's a cool pattern. And there's, there's a, a still and a fluttering version and the same in the, uh, there's a golden stone pattern that I have, uh, uh that is, uh, is really a great and effective pattern that I'm quite fond of. And then, you know, I also have a, a steelhead skater called a palm skater, which is, uh, uh, I think, a very well-engineered fly that performs properly when when tied properly. And uh, yeah, I like that one. You know, I've just uh, just released some new uh, steelhead skaters to Umqua. It'll be a little while before they're out, but you know, I've been doing a lot of tying and in, in, uh, on tubes and. And so I've got what's you know called a uh, I've got a something coming out called a hitched tube skater where uh, in a Scandinavian style you can put the leader as opposed to putting it straight through the front of the tube. There's a little hole in the bottom of the tube on the front third of the hook, and when you you put the leader through there and then thread it on, uh, man, it really skitters. It, it's like a it's like the riffling hitch 
is built into the fly. And uh, I'm pretty excited to have those come out. And those will be a lot of fun because you'll be able to put whatever size hook you like. And so if yeah, you're fishing for uh, you know, a Klamath River steelhead, uh, you know, you might choose to put a, a number six or a number eight trailing hook on there. And if you're up in BC, you know, you might put a two or a four on there. And so you can really mix and match for whatever you're chasing and put the hook on there. That's, that's going to do the least amount of damage without straightening out. That's it. Awesome. Yeah. That's uh, and we didn't even, uh, we probably won't have time here to, to talk about skaters maybe, Maybe down the line, if we can get you back on, we'll, we'll talk more steelhead. Um, but um, I feel I feel pretty good. I mean, hearing hearing your story here, I mean, it, as far as the dry flies, do you want to leave everybody with? You know, I guess we try to dig into a couple of tips. But do you have a tip if somebody's thinking about tying um, dry flies when they're sitting down at the vice? Anything? I know that's kind of a an arbitrary question, but anything come to mind if, to help somebody maybe design a cool fly? Well, like I say, before you design a fly spend a lot of time looking at the natural and and also you know thinking about how the natural behaves on the water but but i think you know it, it to me it, you know it sort of goes back to you know basic academics and 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 spend a lot of time understanding the question before you go out and try to expound with an answer. And I would consider the fly an answer. You know, a pattern is an answer to a question or a, an answer to a problem. And really, yeah, understand the question and then then create the answer. And, uh, and a lot of people just jump right in to the answer phase uh, and, and, and that leads to what I think is, is, is poor fly design. That's right. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, Dave Whitlock, who I had on in a past episode. I'll put mm. a link to that one as well. He, you know, obviously the, the Dave's Hopper, you know, is a, um, you know, I think he might have said that's one of his most, you know, maybe his most famous uh, Hopper or famous pattern or whatever. But I mean, compared to the Dave, do you know what the Dave? Do you know what that one? Comparing your fly to that one, I mean, what what are the, the talking about the answer? How do those get to a different answer? Or, or yeah, know, well, I mean, the Bruce Hopper uh, was without question the finest grasshopper of the time, uh, and 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 it was a really innovative pattern. And you know, Dave, you know, when when that was tied right, you know, he was integrating with deer hair some some really nuanced shapes to the head you know he was he was sculpting that deer hair head in a very particular way and his laid back wing was neat but uh, you know it was also uh you know a natural deer hair head with a yellow belly and you know and and the palmer trimmed hackle on the belly you know that's great but there's nothing like that on a grasshopper, right? They don't, they don't have anything like that, or they don't have a, you know, the, the, you know, the grasshopper's wings lay, lay in line to have a completely pointed back on the fly. And, and, you know, he had some interesting trigger mechanisms, like putting a little red tail that was bent down, you know, he did, he did some cool stuff, uh, but that was, that was, and is a great fly. And, And, you know, him, getting into the whole craft of, you know, knotting legs and things like that. So he, he brought a ton of game into that fly. And, uh, and, you know, the fun thing is, uh, there's still always room to re-envision things. You know, my, the, the Morsh Hopper is a, in many ways a far simpler fly, but it achieves yeah the the end goal i think is even more effective or the end product is even more effective one and uh, and you know it's thanks to guys like whitlock uh, and you know their drawings and their observations and what they've already put forth for us to learn on that you know i'm able to to come up with something that's uh that's equally interesting cool that's cool. Uh, all right, Ken. Well, that's, I think that's all I have for you. Um, you know, as always there, there's a, a lot of stuff I could have dug into, but I'm, I'm glad you were able to, to stick around and, and share the, uh, the fly water story, which is an amazing one and, uh, and a little on your fly tying. So, um, yeah, in the next, uh, next six months or so, anything you want to give a shout out to you have new with fly water or anything you have going? 
You know, uh, yeah, we're we're uh, we're working full tilt on a completely new website that'll be a, a real interesting and powerful and uh, and user friendly one, and so we're really grinding through that right now, and uh, you know, revamping these massive photo libraries and uh, overhauling and editing all of our existing text and uh, and so yeah we're, we're digging in deep and uh, I hope that uh, yeah, that by February that the uh, outside world will be able to surf around on that there you go well this is uh, and I'm not sure exactly when this is going to publish but I think it'll probably be somewhere closer to that um, so this will it'll probably be ready to go by the time this gets going um, Awesome. Well, hey, thanks for all your time. I appreciate what you do and all your contributions to, you know, fly tying and, and travel and, I mean, everything. So uh, definitely thanks for coming on the show. Uh, my pleasure. I really appreciate it and I uh, hope we can talk again soon. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 181. I would love if you can leave a quick rating and review for the show. Go to wetflyswing.com slash love uh, and it'll redirect you to a page where you can leave a quick review. That would be super helpful. And before we get out of here today, I wanted to do a quick little summary of what Ken uh, covered as far as tips on designing dry fly patterns. This goes back to some of his tips on what he does when designing. So number one, look for gaps in the market. So that's one thing. If you're in, in the field, you definitely need to look for gaps. Number two, look for a true silhouette. He noted uh, on his fly, he kind of had it uh, there on his desk for a while, and um, at least the hopper. So think of that silhouette. Number three, um, try to get true proportions. So again, not exact matches, but true proportions is important. Number four, look for similar uh, density as the natural. So I think his hopper with the foam definitely has a similar density. Number five, uh, floats in the surface like a natural, another important thing to be thinking about. Number six, maximum profile with minimal materials. This is for the Moorish mouse. He noted that, um, you know, um, big profile, minimum, uh, minimal materials is important, kind of like the, um, some of the intruder stuff. Number seven, doesn't get waterlogged. Um, so again, going back to the Moorish mouse, He's thinking about design and how to not get that thing so it's like a heavy uh, piece of, you know, uh, <laughs> whatever, chucking. Um, number eight, before you design a fly, look at the natural. So, again, just reminding you to look at the natural bug. What are we looking at here? Number uh, nine, on the same line, spend time looking at the behavior of the naturals in the water. So how are they functioning and how are you imitating that? And number ten, understand the question before developing the pattern. So the answer, the pattern is the answer, but think of the question. What are you trying to answer? Um, so that's a wrap. That's uh, ten, uh, Ken's top 10 here for today. I hope you enjoyed that. You can leave a message for me if you are enjoying these uh, little summaries. Uh, Dave at wetflyswing.com. I want to thank you again for checking out the show. Looking forward to catching up with you soon. I hope to maybe see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.